I believe that storytelling has the power to transform our lives in the most fascinating and unexpected ways. Over my career as a journalist and social entrepreneur, I met individuals whose passion and values are making this world a better place. I am Elizabeth Filippouli, and I invite you to hear the stories of some amazing, inspirational people. I am Rosalie Arteaga. I am uh, uh, the former president of the Republic of Ecuador, and I have uh, a lot of experiences in different fields because I had a lot of interests, uh, not only in politics, but in education, uh, in uh, uh, literary and uh, career, and also in uh, uh, international uh, efforts. Then um, I'm so happy to answer your questions and maybe share with you some ideas. Thank you very much for your time. Well, there are so many questions that I would like to ask someone like yourself with such an exceptional career and background. And I would like to start actually from your childhood. So how does you know, a young, a little girl growing up in Ecuador, which of course has such a stellar career in politics and not only in her life, but what was her childhood like? Uh, well, I'm from the south part of Ecuador. I'm not from the capital. I was born and grew up in a city called Cuenca. It's uh, close to the borders with Peru, the country that we have in the south. Um, my city is uh, a beautiful one. We have uh, like um, uh, in a small city, four rivers going across, across the city. Then we have a lot of bridges. And um, it's a mountain city. We are uh, in the Andean region. Uh, my father was a, is a doctor, a pediatrician. When I, I was born, he was still studying. And um, uh, he met my mom when she was uh, very young. Um, she got married when she was 15 years old, <laughs> very young. And uh, he, she doesn't uh, um, conclude the career. Uh, she uh, stopped it when she was a study, uh, student of um, high school, a high school student. Uh, my grandmom was also very young when she got married. Then in my family, women doesn't study uh, at that time. And in most of the families, it was not uh, like uh, used for girls, only for men. Then I'm the first one in my family that study uh, uh, university career. Uh, but uh, my, my family was a, a middle class family. Uh, I was influenced a lot for, for the uh, environment that I had, a lot in uh, country houses, um, in rural area, a lot uh, like going um, between uh, um, horses and cars and, and all that. But I had the opportunity to read a lot, to read. And I, I, I inherited the love for books from my family, from both sides. My father, my mom, they uh, were all the time with books and talking about what they were reading. And I was curious since I was a, a, little, a little girl. Uh, one anecdote is when they put me in a, in a school, in a Catholic school. When I go there for, I went there for like uh, three weeks, uh, I, I say to my parents, stop, I don't want to study. But what are you saying? Because I don't want to go to the school. They only teach me how to play. And I know how to play very well. I, I, I want to learn to read because I was desperate to know what the books bring to me. Then the, the director of the school um, accepted to put me in a high level. Uh, from this, uh, uh, this early stage. And well, I learned how to, to read. And uh, since that time to now, I never stopped. I read a lot all the time. I read whatever I can, um, like novels, like uh, um, uh, literary books, but also a lot about environment, about law issues, about sociologists, about um, politics, uh, well, geography, I have a lot of interest. Then my life was simple at that time, uh, walking a lot uh, because at that time we didn't have a car. 
um, we didn't have a, a lot of things that now we, we think that we cannot live without that. Then, uh, well, I have a, a, a brother uh, that is two years uh, younger than me and two um, sisters, a lot younger than me. Uh, then we are four in my family. I'm the, the oldest one. And um, uh, I feel since that time that I have some responsibilities with them. In, in, in families before, I, th I don't think it's uh, maintained now, but before we, uh, we assume uh, a lot of uh, responsibilities since we, we were very, very young like taking care of the, of the brother and the sisters, like taking them to the school, uh, like helping them with homeworks. Uh, at that time, my father has his office in, in the same house. Uh, the, the medical uh, doctor, the medical office in, in, the, in front of the house, of the apartment, and then I have to help him to open the door, to answer the phone, uh, to get up early in the morning to have some things uh, ready. And I, I uh, totally agree with the idea that young uh, kids have to help. It's not, uh, it's not child uh, work, no, it's not. But it's some help uh, feeling responsibilities because nowadays I feel that, especially in some uh, sectors of society, kids uh, think that everything is granted, that they don't have responsibilities. And even now when I talk with uh, um, young uh, people that are in, in university and they said, we have to, to stop now because we have to prepare the thesis and to prepare exams and they leave the works. And I say, amazing, it's not possible. We have to share responsibilities like studying at the university and have a partial job and helping at home. I think it's very uh, healthy for families. And I feel that nowadays, sometimes families are not very coherent with these ideas of taking care of some responsibilities for everybody in the family. Everybody has to help. You talked about the love for books and how this love for books has shaped you as, as, a, as a child. Do you remember any of the very first books that you read or uh, the books that actually triggered your thinking or... or gave you some ideas about the world that eventually, as you were growing up, uh, would become your, your dreams and perhaps even your vision? I feel that I have several, several loves in my life uh, about books. I, I was remembering because some time ago, someone from Brazil asked me to, to make like a kind of biography of me. Uh, uh, telling some stories and I decided not to talk only about me but about my grandmom and my mom and I remember that it was so important what I find, found on it because I, I, um, I remember because I talk a lot with uh, my family and my grandma in, in one moment in her life he, she says to me the reading saved me the books saved me because she doesn't have the opportunity to go to school, but she read a lot, then she learns a lot. And my mom, when she stopped and she get pregnant almost immediately, uh, and she had me when she was 16 years old, and she told me once, uh, reading saved me. And I feel on, on my, in, in, my, in my own life, uh, reading and maybe writing saved me because I, I wrote a lot about how I feel in certain moments. Then uh, about books, uh, I have uh, lots of books that usually kids read a lot of stories uh, about animals and about uh, uh, fair tales and about uh, fantastic issues. I remember one book where I was sick uh, in a moment, uh, not, uh, not very bad, but uh, my father says to stay at, uh, in bed and he bring to me uh, the book of uh, 1,000 uh, and one stories, a big book. And, uh, I decided not to get, um, uh, get, get okay to go to school until I finished that. And my father was a kind of very soft with me and said, okay, tell me when you finish the book and then you can go to school. Then it was probably after a week that I stayed reading. But I had a lot of influence. I, I lo uh, now I read a lot of uh, uh, literature that was, is written by women. We have in Latin America extraordinary authors, uh, Isabel Allende or um, Angeles Mastreta 
or uh, Spanish war ones. And also one of my favorites is one from Belgium, Margarita Yurcenar, that uh, was the first woman to be part of the uh, Academy of, uh, of uh, Arts and Literature in, in France, being a non-French uh, non woman, from, but from Belgium. And um, I, I found fantastic uh, books. Uh, I, I also read a lot uh, uh, when I was a teenager, uh, some Argentinian authors like Jorge Luis Borges and others. Um, and uh, I feel that uh, unfortunately now I don't have all the time that I want uh, for reading. But um, in, in terms of uh, uh, the quality of books, uh, I find that I'm more selective now that I was when I, I was a child or, or I was a, a teenager. I guess uh, a question that comes to mind because you talked about your family and your parents and of course your grandma and uh, I, I can understand that because my grandma, she was not educated, but she was such a strong and fierce woman and such a role model for me. Um, I wonder if you had a role model as you were growing up, either a woman or a man or yeah. a mentor that, that influenced you. Because for us as Athena 40 and Global Thinkers Forum, the whole idea of mentoring and, and bringing to the forefront role models is very important. Yeah, I, I strongly feel that in Ecuador, not only in my family, but in Ecuador, women have been uh, stronger than men. Uh, role models uh, of women. Uh, and of course, I, I have in my own family, grandmother or, or great grandmother, because I had the opportunity to, to have uh, uh, her alive until I was a, a, a mom, even when I have my kid. And um, of course, they were my role models, but also I have my father that had a great influence in me uh, in, uh, until now, because I'm very lucky to have my parents alive. Uh, but I also feel some independent fighters like Manuela Sainz, the, the one was, that was the, uh, the couple of uh, Simon Bolivar, the great liberator of Latin America. And, and she was such a strong personality, uh, such a, uh, anticipated uh, in the times that uh, she was living that I feel that she was a role model for me. And I, I think it influences uh, so much on me that, that the only um, girl, uh, uh, a daughter that I have, I put her name, Manuela, in terms of remembering me, the, the influence that I had when I was a student. And before getting to the very important chapter of your family and your kids, I would like uh, to, to visit first uh, the young woman now, I mean, Rosalia, as perhaps you know, the 16, 17 year old, who was she? And how did she pick the studies that she picked? So, so we know what influenced you. We know that uh, it was very important for you to read and that very much informed what you became in life from your childhood years. But uh, 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 what was it like when you were those formative years for a young woman, 17, 18 years old, and then your studies? Since the beginning, since I was learning how to read and, and write, I decided to be an author. I decided to be a writer. And I started to be writing, uh, to, to write some short stories since I was uh, maybe seven, eight, nine years. Um, and, and I continue writing until now. I uh, graduated from high school when I was 17. And uh, the director of the school asked me if I want to be a teacher. For me, it was a big surprise because usually you don't, uh, you, 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 you didn't get a job to be a teacher when you were 17. Uh, but at that time, I started also uh, to be a leader in my high school. I, I was the best student. I always have the best uh, um, qualifications in all the, all the issues in school and high school. And um, I, uh, I also, uh, at the time that I graduated from high school, I started to, to study the career of law at the university. And um, um, at the same time, I, was, uh, I started to write in a newspaper 
um, then uh, when I graduate, I feel that I was studying at the university. I was uh, working in my high school, teaching to students that sometime are, were older than me. And then um, uh, I started to write in a, in a newspaper. Then I have a, a very crowded, a very crowded uh, life. And of course I have some duties at home uh, with my, my family. And um, I was enthusiastic about uh, attending parties, of course, like every, every young girl in the world, <laughs> and um, having a lot of friends and uh, participations. I was, uh, I was very active in uh, politics at the university also. I was uh, hired by, by some group that asked me to be part of, uh, um, of a list and participate like candidate at the university and won the participation. And um, yes, I, I had um, uh, a good life in terms of um, I was uh, feeling that I can do lots of things and very active. Um, that was part of the life. And of course, I maintain some, some friends since that time to now, friends from the school, the primary school. I met every time that I go to my, my own city, to my home city, because I now live in the capital uh, since long time ago. And I, the other thing that I, I learned, um, uh, since that early times uh, when I was uh, finishing the school is that uh, I love to travel. Mm -hmm. I, I, know, I love to meet people. Uh, the first uh, travel that impacted me a lot was going to Galapagos Island. Uh, that is a place that is part of Ecuador. And um, I think it's a place that you must know at least once in life, go there. It is fantastic and, and I start to be concerned about uh, biodiversity, about how to protect uh, the, the fauna and the flora of that such an impressive place, even if at that time, because I'm talking about the uh, 1770s, um, it was not a concern about environmental issues uh, at that time, but uh, I, I get impacted by what I saw when I visit Galapagos. And then I decided I can help some some efforts uh, probably in, in terms of what I can do uh, to protect the environment, that it was more deeper on me in late, later when I grow up. You talked about um, running for president or being part of the university's uh, political framework, as in probably elections and admin and, and supporting uh, how the university was run, the good governance of, on behalf of, of the students, I assume. Could you give us the context of the time? We're talking about um, perhaps, I don't know, uh, two or three decades ago. So it was a different country, it was a different context. What was it that triggered you to become part of this uh, public decision-making process and become part of this governance at, at the students level back then? Well, um, when I talk with some people that had developed a political career, they told me that they wanted to be in a political career almost then since the school, but it was not my case. I didn't feel that I was uh, called for a political career and I was not interested at all. Um, I was interested in an author and a literary career, but not in a political one. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I started to be part of uh, some initiatives at the university. Well, I, I feel interest about what was happening in the world. I was writing for the newspaper about uh, some issues and, and talking about some political issues in my own city um, and in the country. Of course, I, I start to be visible for some people. I start to be visible since, uh, very, since I was very young. Uh, because if you write in a newspaper, in a daily one, in the editorial, I don't know how they accepted me to write in the editorial page. Uh, some people start to see me. Uh, well, uh, in the university, uh, I decided in the middle of the career when I was 21 uh, to get married. And I get married with the mayor of the city. Then political touch on my, on my home. And, he was uh, my teacher in high school, a teacher of literature and history, especially literature. And I get a lot of interest in literature. After when I graduated, we were colleagues because I, I, I was part of the 
of the group of teachers of the university and I found him like teacher because he was also a lawyer, teacher at the university. Then, then our paths crossed many times, uh, but I never imagined that um, I would get married with him. But when um, it starts, uh, well, I decided and he, uh, before we get married, uh, like a month before we get married, he won the election to be the mayor. Uh, Cuenca is the third city of Ecuador, then a very important city in, in my country. Then suddenly, when 21, I, I get to be the first lady of my city. Don't know at all. I, I didn't know what to do being a, because I, I, I never stopped to study, to, to finalize my career. I didn't, I, I didn't want to, to experience what my mother experienced, to stop to study, I decided to continue studying, and I uh, decided to continue teaching and writing, writing literary books. I started to be published um, very young also, uh, some book of uh, short stories and things like that, and uh, I also wanted to continue writing for newspapers. Then my, was, my life was, was a crazy, craziness, because I started to be a mom very, very young, 22, I had my first boy, 23, I have a failure. Um, I didn't uh, complete the, the, the pregnancy because uh, something happens. I decided to have another one. I meant second, uh, second um, kid uh, was probably the big influence that I have in my life. Uh, I, I get my second boy, Geronimo is his name, and he was a Down syndrome. I feel at that time that my, my life was shocked. My father, the, the pediatrics, the doctor, tell me, Geronimo is a Down syndrome kid. I didn't know what to do. Uh, but uh, finally, after a week that I feel that my life was ending, I said, okay, probably he arrives to my home because we are prepared for him. And uh, I will dedicate, uh, a lot of efforts to him. And we started like a couple uh, to be uh, involved a lot in efforts. And, and, and I know at that time, some other stories of people that in the past I never pay attention. And uh, unfortunately, my kid started to get sick. Um, and he unfortunately passed away when he was 10 months, uh, less than a year when it, it, uh, it happens that he was not with us, I was pregnant of Manuela. Then imagine how was my life at that time. And I say that he was the biggest influence because my little kid tell, tell me and teach me, teach me um, how important is life, how important are relations, how important are things that probably for others are not important, that have the sunshine, shines, the nature, uh, the simple things of life. Because I, during this period, I, I learned a lot about, li about life. When he passed away, I was destroyed. But I had another kid, two years uh, old boy, and another one growing on me. And say, so I have to be strong. And um, it teach me a lot about life, about situations, about uh, compassion, about uh, solidarity. And um, after a, a while, uh, after a week uh, that my, my, my boy passed away, I decided to write his story. And um, I, wrote, I, I wrote a book like a kind of catharsis for me because I need to, to write what I was, I was feeling but also thinking that maybe other parents and other families can uh, learn about my history. Um, at the same time, I, I was graduating uh, my doctoral degree uh, in law. Uh, I was feeling that I cannot do that. And I asked the teachers, please stop, I cannot. And they, they told me not. You, you have a date and you have to respect that date. And I feel grateful with them because if no, I probably never graduate because I was association, all the pain that I have, the family situation, uh, I, I was having another kid and things like that. But they were, they were very strong with me and says, we know what you are suffering, but um, you need to maintain, we need to maintain the date. 
And I remember, and I graduate uh, from my doctoral degree uh, in this bad situation. And I have my kid and I have after another kid, but Geronimo is always present. Um, I wrote after some years, another book called The Other Geronimos, where I recover all the stories that I hear around the country and outside of the country about kids with Down syndrome. It's not a scientific book, uh, but it's a very touching book. It was translated into other languages. It was translated into English, into uh, Portuguese, Chinese, um, Italian. Um, and I feel, because the, the strange thing is that I, I wrote the book for parents, but amazing, in Ecuador especially, teenagers read that book. And it's part of the, of the books that they read when they are studying. And I make a lot of presentations, I go all around the country talking with kids. Sometimes they tell me, I hate, I hate to read, but the only book that I, I love to read is your book. And I feel that I'm opening a door for them to love reading. And um, sometimes others uh, and, and older people say, I never imagined that I will cry reading a book, but I, we are crying. But at the same time, we are, we are feeling hope because it's, it's a sad book. Of course, it's because my baby died. But at the same time, I try to to put some, some hope, some, some things like that. Then, you know, in my life, things uh, are mixed. Political issues, because I was the, uh, in, immersed in a political life. I received the president, I received the ministers, being um, the, uh, the wife of the mayor. But at the same time, I was growing up a family. I was finishing a career, writing, and, and doing a lot of things. And, uh, mm, I, I feel that in, in my life, most of the time, I have all these roads that I have to go on, all these roads, and I try to, to get and do the things. But uh, Geronimo is the presence that I feel very close. The, it's probably the, the, the son, uh, the kid that I talk more about him, uh, maybe the others that are around me. And, and now I, I am a granny. I have seven grandkids. Uh, they are around me. Uh, but uh, the presence of Geronimo is always, even if he spends with me only 10 months. Sorry for mix this, but that's, that is, this is part of my life and I can not avoid to tell this, this story. No, thank you for sharing this because uh, this is exactly what, you know, I want to visit with you. What shaped you as an individual, what shaped you as a woman, as a politician, as a leader, as the social impact uh, person you became. And of course, having such a story, um, uh, it's, it cannot but, you know, be of interest to all of us. Uh, and I wanted to ask you just to stay for another minute on this particular part and time of your life. What was the biggest legacy, the most impactful legacy that Geronimo left within you? Uh, the legacy that uh, Geronimo gave to me, uh, the appreciation of life, the solidarity for others, the, lo the knowledge about differences, because uh, I learned from that stage that all of us were different, but we are not superior to others and we are equal. It doesn't matter if you have a, a sickness or if you have a situation in your, in your life, but we are human beings and we have to respect the others. Then uh, probably the legacy is, is the respect and the solidarity for other people. Thank you. And then you talked about your degree, uh, your PhD in law. Um, you became a lawyer, so, so a journalist first, of course, becoming the first uh, uh, lady of the city. I can only imagine the responsibility for a 21-year-old, a 22-year-old going through the pregnancies and, and the births and these challenges. I can only imagine the, um, the, the challenges and the burden. Um, uh, uh, what drew you to law? What was it that uh, made you want to pick law as studies? And uh, did you um, actually execute the... Um, uh, well, the about, about the law career. At the beginning, when I was finishing high school, I was uh, thinking to, to study um, 
philosophy or literature or things like that. But I remember a talk with my father. He says to me, with, uh, with, this, with that career, you are going to be a teacher. But you are already a teacher. You don't need to study something like that. Why you don't explore something different? Well, I say probably I want a humanistic career and I, I decided law, social science, uh, like political science and, and law. Um, well, uh, then I start to be a student of law and I found that it was uh, something that I like and um, especially the humanistic view of the law. And I love the international and also uh, uh, the um, the interactions between different legisl legislations. Uh, well, uh, when I finish the career, I feel, well, I don't want to go to, 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 to fight with others uh, in, in terms of uh, doing my profession. Uh, and I, uh, I very seldom uh, practice law until now, very seldom. I have my title, I can, I can litigate, but I don't like to litigate. Then I, I, I took that like a preparation and it helps me in my, a lot in my political career to know about law, to, to know uh, the responsibilities, the rights and other things. Um, but after I finished my career of law, I immediately decided to go into philosophy and I studied for a while philosophy, but I had the situation in my family, then I decided to stop. After that, uh, I have my, uh, my sister that is very close to me, Claudia, uh, and she is uh, 10 years uh, younger than me. But when she finished high school, I say, why we don't create a journal, a newspaper? And, and she was also 17, 18, and I was uh, 29, and we decided to create a journal. It was uh, first a weekly, <laughs> a weekly newspaper, and after it was a daily newspaper. Imagine two young girls creating a newspaper. Well, then I feel at that time that I need to study, to study also journalism. And then I go again, I went to the university and studied the, the complete career of, of journalism. It was until 92. Well, we maintained the journal, um, but after I, since I was at the, the last years at university, I started to be linked with a party, a political party that was not the party of my husband. It was a totally different party. Uh, at the beginning, we had some troubles for that because he asked me, why, if you want to be in political arena, why you don't want to be in my party? And said, because I don't like the conservative party. I'm not like that. Um, and it doesn't, I, it doesn't feel that being uh, uh, the wife of uh, one person, you have to assimilate exactly the same. Then I, it, it takes some discussion at, at home. But finally, I was part of that political party. And um, uh, after some years, it was before uh, I moved to Quito, um, I was so involved in that political career because I like a lot a leader of the party. Uh, that was uh, a man uh, very, uh, um, very strong in terms of his responsibilities. He uh, was uh, part of that political party, party for a long time ago. Then I decided to follow that, that person. And he was a kind of mentor in political issues for me. Um, well, um, uh, I, I participate like a candidate for councilwoman. Uh, and I won the election. Then my first step uh, in, in this political arena uh, was to be a councilwoman. And I was in, in um, cultural efforts in uh, uh, terms of um, uh, protecting the historical uh, um, center of my city and working on that. But at the same time, I was teaching and I, was, I never stopped to teach uh, uh, at that times. And I was uh, growing the family and I was writing and writing for newspapers and everything, then I was a very visible person. Uh, the candidate that I was supporting, he lost elections for presidential career two times. Uh, he was always trying to push me and say, you can be candidate of mayor of to, to the parliament. And I said, I don't feel like that. I, I, I'm wanting to support you and I do in my other stuff that I love to do. Um, 
But finally, in 92, when he was uh, running for, her, uh, for his uh, third time to be president of the republic, he won the election. And um, I received an offer to be uh, the undersecretary of culture. I was at that time a writer and I was involved in that. that. It, it uh, at that time means that I have to move my family from my city to the capital. And I make an agreement with the husband and with the family, okay, just for a year. <laughs> well, I'm until now here. <laughs> but the, the idea was just for a year. Because women, we have to, to agree. Uh, I know that men many times took the decision. I will run for that. I will accept this, this job. Uh, and, and after the family has to, to make a coincidence, okay, okay, agree. But uh, women, we have to negotiate it. And it, it took time, it took time. Um, well, then I accepted that. I moved myself first and the family come with me. Um, it was 92 and I was the undersecretary of culture and I enjoy and I love that work because I have to deal with symphonic orchestra, with the painters, with the writers. And I put a lot of dynamic on it. Um, probably in the past, the undersecretary of culture doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, uh, have a, 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 a good profile because most of them, they, of they were writers or singers or that, but they don't have the wide range of activities that I developed at that time. And I have the possibility also to talk with the president that probably other undersecretaries of culture never uh, get uh, the, the possibility to talk with the president. Well, I have this on, on my side. I have to work with the Minister of Education that was Minister of Education, Culture and Sports. Um, well, 94, uh, it was, uh, 93, it was a big problem with teachers. At that time, the syndicate of teachers in Ecuador were, was, were very powerful and they, uh, they have a lot of pressure on ministers. The minister resigns, my boss. And the presidency, president suddenly called me and he asked me a question. He, or, or maybe talk about something that he was, that he was thinking. I say, he said, I want you to offer the position of minister of education, but I am adopting, I'm not sure about it. Because I don't know if you, being a woman, can deal with this big syndicate of teachers that uh, they, they, they get the resign of the other minister. Probably if he didn't uh, make that uh, sentence or question, I would not accept because I, I had a compromise with my family to go back to my city. But making the question in that way, put in the issue that probably I could not be a good minister because I am a woman, I was a woman. I say, okay, if you dare, I will. Then I never consult my family at that time and say, okay, I accept. And suddenly I developed to be the first woman minister of education of my country. And it was a big challenge. After, of course, I talked with my family, they agreed to maintain for more time in, in, this, in the capital. And I said, okay, I will be a good minister of education, culture and sports. I know a lot about culture, sports, little bit, education. I was a teacher for almost 20 years. Then I know how the teachers feel. And I feel that I was a very um, successful minister of education. After me, there are several women that can be in minister of education, but I, I was the first one. And I developed a good relation with teachers. I never had a problems with the syndicate. I was strong on my decisions. I, I changed a lot on it, of education. I'd get, I get a uh, biggest budget for education. Um, and I also um, do a kind of uh, reform on, on the curricula of education, especially primary education. Some people say that after, it, it happens in 24, now we are in 2020. And uh, 94, uh, excuse me, it was in, in 94, and now we are in 2020. But I feel sometimes that people say, your reform was the best. We are practicing your reform when I go to schools. Then I feel that I, I made a difference. Of course, I, I, I take care of education, culture, and sports, and I learn a lot about sports. 
Uh, but suddenly, at the, end, at the end of the first year that I was Minister of Education, I had a trouble with my own government. They decided to uh, discuss in the parliament and the Congress the law about putting classes of religion in schools, in public schools. And I say, no, we don't have to mix religion and, and education and public affairs. Of course, if you, I, I grew up in, in a Catholic school. I, I was a teacher in a Catholic high school, but I don't think we have to mix uh, the state, the government and uh, religion. Then I resigned. Uh, president was astonished why you are doing that. I was the best evaluated minister of the cabinet. I said, I cannot put in practice uh, something that in my principles, I don't believe that it has to be done. Uh, my advisors at that time says, uh, you are making a political su suicide because now the bishops are talking about you and they are saying bad things about you in the masses. And uh, the, the president and the others there were not supporting me and say, okay, it doesn't matter. I never think that I has a political career to do. I will go back and, and do things. Well, we talked to family. My kids were uh, growing up uh, very happy with the schools and that and say, don't move to Cuenca. Okay, we can go. Uh, we can stay here in the capital. But uh, well, in terms of political career, I think, uh, I think that it was... Uh, uh, a mistake for my advisor thinks that it was a suicide. I grew up a lot. All the media was talking about me. People think that even if they don't agree with me, they agree with uh, a person that because of the principles resigned to a ministry. Then suddenly I have a lot of proposals to be in a political arena, candidate for vice president of the Republic. I would like to understand, also for the sake of our viewers and our listeners, about the story uh, on mixing religions in the classroom, in schools. So what was that exactly? What was the request which you said, this is not viable, this is not sustainable, or is not the right thing to do for our schools and for our youth? Could you explain it a bit? In Ecuador, we had only one revolution. The revolution was the liberal revolution. Um, it was at the beginning of, night of 20th century. Uh, it was made by the man that was a visionary, Eloy Alfaro, one of the most admired personalities in the whole story of Ecuador. And he fight to separate religion and state. Because uh, if you mix it, you can create a lot of troubles. In the world, there are a lot of troubles when religion is mixed with public affairs. Uh, in, uh, and uh, the decision at that time in the government was to separate. Public schools don't have to mess with religion. Public schools, no. And it was very healthy for us. If you want, because you want to have uh, your, your kids in a Catholic, uh, because we, have, we are majority Catholic uh, uh, society, but also if you want to have in an evangel evangelic or a Muslim, you can have the kids, it's not uh, a problem. But public schools doesn't have to be with uh, religion. And I think it was, uh, and it is very healthy uh, because when you start, start to mix and you create uh, differences between the kids, uh, the intolerance is going on. And I remember that the, the most important legacy that I received uh, with uh, my kid is to be tolerant, to be comprehensive with difference. We don't have to be the same exactly, but you have to, 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 to respect the others. It doesn't matter if it's about religion or if it's about uh, some situation of, of, of uh, et ethnics or things like that. You don't have to, to make differences. Then for me, it was vital to maintain the situation and not to let to start against fights, fights because religion, because in most of the countries, big troubles starts with religion because people from one religion thinks that they have the right and the other. I respect every religion. I was, I was baptized in Catholic religion, but I l work a lot with Muslims. I work a lot, I work a lot with Jewish, with people from other, other religions. And, and it is for me, um, uh, something so important that I couldn't agree with that kind of law 
to be discussed at the, at the because I have been the minister, I have to put in, uh, in practice that, uh, that new law. Then uh, I didn't accept that. Another thing which impressed me, uh, of course, was what you mentioned before that you were challenged by this, uh, you can't do that because you're a woman. If you were a man, then I would have no hesitance in, in uh, making you a minister to handle the syndicates effectively and successfully. So you opened the way, you paved the way for other women in politics, for other women as ministers, which means decision makers, which means part of, of you know, uh, the, the, shaping the fate, the destiny of the country. But give us the context of what was it back then? How many other women ministers were you uh, a minority, I assume, in your government? And how did that change women in political leadership in Ecuador? Well, I can show you some pictures where you find that I was the only one at the cabinet at that, st at that time, the only one. And after when I was vice president of the Republic, for example, I didn't have in the army um, uh, officials, women officials to put uh, with me because they, they, they didn't um, get the degree to be in, the, in this position. Then it's another picture where I have my, my bodyguards and all of them are men. Um, now things are changing, are change a lot. We have also the, the law that uh, um, says that uh, in the elections, we have the, the same uh, number of women and men, parity, 50-50. Uh, and it is uh, different than in other countries, like, like in Colombia, for example, 20, uh, uh, the, the obligation to be part of a political list of a political party, 20%, but ours is 50-50. And uh, they had been a lot of very interesting women fighting for rights of women in Ecuador and in other countries. Um, when I uh, was, uh, for example, candidate for council woman, um, it was also strange to, to, to feel a woman participating, uh, even for be a council, council person. Um, and it's amazing because I, I feel that women can do a lot. And um, also uh, when I feel that uh, uh, being uh, in uh, the municipality is uh, like a civic participation, why, why they are not more women. Uh, when I, um, I won the election, many people was like, wow, how she can won an election? At that time we were two council women in, in, that, in that municipality, but it was very strange. Uh, I grew up in a, in a world, in political arena, that, were, that we had plenty of men, but very few women. But after that, um, and many girls say that they follow my steps, and I'm very happy for that. Um, only yesterday I, I read a, an article, and an interview, um, that was made for a young political woman that very, very, very important. And when they ask her, who is the most respected woman in politics in Ecuador? And usually people answer talking of someone that passed away, but no one that is alive. And, and she says my name, uh, most respected. And um, after the, the journalist um, ask again, and who is the most admired for you? And she again put my name. And I feel, oh my God, I, I feel that I can touch uh, souls and I can touch careers. And I, I feel really grateful with life because of these opportunities that I had. I have to work very hard. Uh, I tell you that uh, in my family with my parents, I never feel that I was less than my brother, never. My, my father especially, but my mom also, they always say, says you are all the same and you have the right to study. I remember my grandfather on the, on the side of my father, when I decided to go to university, he asked me, why? You probably are going to get married. You need to, to, to know how to cook and to do things at home. And I say, I'm going to study law. Such a long career, it's for men. And, and I love and I, I take like, like uh, something uh, light, but it was his, uh, his feelings. But when my, my sister graduated from, from high school, he never asked her, now you are going to stay at home. He asked her, what are you going to study? 
Yeah, his mind, his mind changes. And uh, when she says journalism, and he asked, and why this is small career? Maybe you can use, you can, you can study a more important career. And he was not questioning the decision to study of my sister 10 years after. But in my case, he questioned it. Then people can evolve. He, people can change and, and feel that uh, you can do whatever you want. In my family, it was, it was fantastic. In my, my small family with my parents and my uh, brother and sisters. But after, when I was in politics, I feel a lot the difference and how women uh, were isolated and wanted many people that they don't participate, that then they go, don't uh, go. And even now I feel that the situation for women is uh, more demanding. We have more responsibilities even now. And because I talk a lot with young women and I feel what's happening and they have to share uh, responsibilities at home that maybe men doesn't take. And uh, also um, the, uh, the feeling that we have to be better to be uh, feeling like equal, but you have to work more being a woman, even now. Uh, you became the first uh, female president of Ecuador, following a tenure as a vice president. I am sure that it was anything but easy, especially since you had to, uh, to clash also with, uh, at the time, Fabian Alarcón, yes? Yes, yes. Could you give us, could you remember um, your, your feelings at the time, your emotions at the time, and also who was around you to support you psychologically, because that is also very important. I'm sure your family, of course, you had your family behind you, but who else was there for you to, to give you strength and determination to, to go ahead and, and clash for, you, for the right? Well, um, I, I was telling you this story, how I decided to participate uh, and create a political moving, movement. Uh, when I realized after, because at that, at that time, I was not thinking that it's the first time that a woman create a political movement. But, but after that, I, I, I think about what happens and I say, my God, I, I feel that I was opening many times the, the road because it was the first time that uh, with my sister we create a journal. It's, it was the first time that women create a journal, a newspaper, a daily newspaper. And it was uh, us. Of, of course, we get the support of friends and investors and that, but it was talking about the 90s. It was impossible in Ecuador to think uh, on something like that. And after, with the, with the political movement, when I realized there were not other movements at that time created by, by women, then at the beginning, and I, I, we choose a color for the party that it, it was like a, a fuchsia, fuchsia, pur like purple, a light purple, and it, it was uh, like, uh, like a rose, no? Um, it was ali uh, um, aligned with uh, people says, oh my God, how I can use this shirt? It's, it seems that it's for a woman. And they, at the beginning, thought that it was a political party only for women. And it was not true, but the leaders, we were women uh, in most of the provinces of Ecuador, because I choose a lot of teachers of people that were um, in, in my surrounders. Um, and after, well, I accepted to be vice president of the Republic with a terrible candidate, a terrible president of the Republic. He was uh, out of the position uh, after six months because of really bad situations in the country. And it, I feel that being a woman avoid me to, be, to maintain my position of president of the Republic. Because the only thing that I can say is that I was a woman. Then the, the president of the Congress, Alarcón, took it, the position in a way that they, they broke the constitution, they broke the democracy. They, they didn't find in, in, my, in my activity anything uh, that, that could be corruption or, or things like that. They, they can never do, think on that. On, on that about my uh, actions or my, my work in, in, the, in the previous position, then I feel that I, I lose the president of the Republic only for being a woman. And that's, that is true. I, um, you you talk, asked me about who supported me in that time. I feel, of, of course, the support of my family and also the support of several women. 
I, it's a pity that at that time they were not uh, really um, big of organizations of women, and also we don't we didn't have the social network because probably if it happens at that time I will never lose the presidency because uh, I, I feel the support and even now I feel the support in, on the streets of my my country when I go and present my books uh, to the kids or uh, or I do. Uh, a speech, I feel the support. And um, I, I think a lot of, of people, they regret and say, why we didn't do any other thing at that time? But it was the situation. And um, well, uh, I, I used to write about what I feel. Then after I, I lose the presidency, I wrote a book also about what happens. The name of the book is The President. I put in Spanish because, because we make the difference between a president man and a president woman. Uh, then in Spanish, it is la presidenta to emphasize that it was a woman. And um, it was the bestseller during the first uh, uh, months. Um, I have to sign a lot of photographs. And nowadays, I am trying to rewrite that book because with all what happens during these more than 20 years, um, I feel that I have to, to um, uh, write some other chapters and to do some other reflections. Uh, after the years, we, we know better what happens and wh what were the conditions of the political, military, international situations at that time. Then I'm rewriting that book. If you were to summarize in a, a sentence or two, what was your biggest lesson from politics? <laughs> well, first, you cannot be confident in everybody surrounding you. <laughs> I learned that uh, because uh, at that time, uh, usually I'm very confident about people, but sometimes you don't have to believe on that. The other lesson is, uh, uh, Maintain the integrity is very important. I never change that. Uh, then some people ask me, would you change some things? Uh, if you have done some other things, um, accept the possibilities to, to get money on, on to, or to pay to others? I said, no, I, I, I probably would do the same now that uh, I, I, I have done during this time, more than 20 years ago. It is uh, amazing, but uh, after 20 years uh, uh, that uh, things happened in 97, only two years ago, the government decided to put my portrait on the gallery of presidents of the Republic. Imagine that. Usually after a, a small period of time, uh, the portraits of the presidents are on the, on the gallery, but no, it was not my case. The woman of my country asked the president, you must put the portrait there. And the last president accepted to put the portrait, but, but it was not free. It was a fight of the woman to put the portrait there. Now it's there. And it should be there and well-deserved. And uh, I'm very glad to hear that other women fought for it and yes. restored the position because it's, it's the symbol and you have been a symbol of leadership for your country and, and women the world over, actually, I would say. So uh, uh, you move on and you become an environmental supporter. You join the um, uh, Amazon Treaty. You become the Secretary yes. General. And so you focus your efforts and your energy in um, fighting for the Amazon. Could you uh, share a bit about that period in your life? And also, again, the lessons, because it is always about the lessons and the main conclusions uh, from, from working towards uh, different missions. Well, um, as I told you, since the, this uh, trip to Galapagos in an old boat, I feel that uh, biodiversity is fantastic and we have to protect it. After I wrote several articles about environment, and also I published a book about the trees of my region, the Arboles de Cuenca, trees of Cuenca. And um, I get involved in, in some, some movements and ideas, but uh, I received the proposal of the government in 2004 to be candidate for being the general secretary of the Amazon Cooperation Treaty Organization. Well, I accepted because I feel the Amazon is one of the 
most important places in the whole world is the like the air conditioning of the of the of the world and uh, the best reserve of uh, biodiversity of on the world of the world then i accepted i fight to be elected it was not easy i, I think most of the things in my, in life they are not easy it's not granted that you you get the position after you get the, to be the candidate uh, well i won the position and it was another change in my life because i have to move to live in brazil because the headquarters of this organization is in brazil and um, uh, well, I, I have to move there and live in Brasilia, change life. Um, I had my, my family that grow, uh, grow up and it was not a problem. And um, well, uh, I spent uh, more than three marvelous years in, uh, in Brazil. It was my second time that I lived in Brazil because when I uh, was younger, uh, I decided to to accept a scholarship and I study anthropology in Brazil. It was a long, long time ago. Then uh, I am fluent in Portuguese and it facilitated a lot my work there. And I start to put the organization in a high level. I was the first um, woman to be um, the general secretary of that organization. And I work close to several presidents because my board of uh, uh, directors were the presidents and the ministers of foreign affairs. I learn a lot. I walk a lot through the Amazon and navigate a lot through the Amazon. I know uh, uh, because I'm still linked with an organization called Panamazonia in Manaus in Brazil and I have several friends there and I continue to be linked with initiatives with the Amazon and I'm so sad about what's happening with the uh, the risks uh, that uh, are um, the, all the situations and the danger that uh, uh, means uh, the fires in the Amazon and the, the exploration of resources. I know that many people that live in the Amazon, that lives in the Amazon, they are concerned about it, but also they feel that they have to be granted in terms of good quality of life and resources to live. And it's not, uh, some people feel that the Amazon is an empty, empty space with lots of trees and lots of animals, but it's not an em empty space. In the Amazon, that is the 40% of the territory of uh, South America, they live uh, almost, uh, or maybe more than 30 million inhabitants. Then there's a lot of people, some of them are tribes, uh, they are um, original groups, but some of, of theirs are people that arrived there long time ago and they feel this territory that their own territory and they love it. Then it's uh, not easy to, to maintain a balance between the desires of progress of people that live there because the, uh, also the needs of the governments, for example, most of the oil in Latin America is in this site and also precious stones and mining, and it's not easy to maintain an equilibrium between the needs of the governments, the needs of the people, and the need to maintain the forest, the rainforest. Then I, um, and I get a lot of resources uh, from the different corporations uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, we create uh, some programs about biodiversity, about the indigenous people, about water resources, um, about monitoring the, the rainforest. It was a fantastic experience for me. After I, I finished my period, I go back to Ecuador and I continue working in, in several issues. And you're also a member of this global policy think tank, an Ijami Ganjavi International Center, uh, which consists of current and former and former presidents and heads of state. And I'm sure that one of the topics that uh, you are uh, focusing your efforts currently are, uh, is the crisis that we are going through because of this pandemic, because of the virus. Yes. How do you think that priorities now, local and global, have shifted because of the pandemic? Well, uh, I'm part of several initiatives. The Ninsami Ganjam International Center is one of these initiatives. I'm also part of the board of trustees uh, of uh, the library of uh, Alexandria. 
and I'm part of Women Political Leaders, that is another organization with headquarters in Brussels and, and other, other initiatives. Uh, I also, I'm also very proud to have been part of the editorial board of Encyclopedia Britannica, British Encyclopedia, and it was also a wonderful experience. I had a lot of interest, uh, and uh, as you can see, also in scientific issues. Uh, they am part of the, the Royal Academy of Doctors of Europe in Barcelona and others initiatives. But about uh, what are the main goals uh, after this pandemic and during the pandemic? I signed it uh, because of initiatives uh, that were taken by Ninsami Ganjavi International Center and personalities from the whole world. I signed it about, for example, um, one question about the need that uh, the vaccine has to be a public good when we get it, uh, because it has to be available for everybody. And also uh, about educational efforts, because sometimes we are thinking a lot in economic situation, in health situation, but not in education. Um, UNESCO says that we are going back 10 years in education, and it is really bad. Um, education of quality is not available in, in, in the different countries, especially in rural areas, poor areas, how we can uh, get the goals, how we can maintain the quality, and how we can maintain the kids in school, because a lot of uh, uh, situations, economic situations, are putting the parents in the decision which kid is going to maintain in the school. Unfortunately, many women are going to be out of school, and it's uh, really another call that we have to do: maintain the girls in school, maintain the girls in school, uh, because if no, it's going to be a going back in times in, in, of history. Also, a lot of women has to take care of kids. They are um, living works. Uh, leaving jobs because they, they feel the pressure of the family to maintain and to be there taking care of how they, the kids are going to connect, how they are going to do the homework. Um, well, it's going to be a, a, again a getting back uh, in terms of job, uh, uh, of woman job and um, education uh, for women. Uh, then I, I feel that we have to do more efforts in these fields and also, of course, in, in how to, to, to talk about the external debt of the non-developed countries because the impact is going to be a lot more uh, bad in, um, in poor countries like uh, most of Latin American countries like Ecuador, for example. Um, we're getting to the last part, the final part of this uh, interview and conversation. And of course, uh, I would like to ask you if you would like to convey a specific message to uh, other women, uh, younger women, older women, um, if they want to be engaged in politics or if they want to become leaders and decision makers in whatever area and industry uh, is close to their heart. What would be your main advice to them? Well, um, I think uh, the main advice is uh, to feel that we can, to the self-esteem, uh, to strongly believe that we, the women, can be very powerful, that we can do whatever we want. The other advice, we have to be prepared. It's very important. Then we have to be curious to try to know as much as we can and uh, to continue learning because the life, life is a process of learning. No, it's not because you, you end the school, the high school, the university, the post-graduation, you get the degrees. No, you must learn every day of the life. Not only from universities, not only from academia, you we need to learn from life also. And um, well, self-esteem, knowledge, and also respect for the others. I'm, I'm really um, excited to have had this opportunity <laughs> to uh, interview you, Mrs. Arteaga. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to mention, to, to share? Uh, with, uh, with other people through this interview? Well, uh, I feel that even in, in sad situations, and I had, uh, as I told you, very sad situations, uh, very strong situations in life, don't lose our sense of humor. 
the possibility to smile, to say nice things to others, um, to feel that we can make the difference. And um, not uh, because we are fighting still now to, to take positions, to go into public affairs, but don't, don't think that we have to adopt the male models. We have our models, female models, and uh, you, we can use it and be successful too. What gets you excited when you wake up in the morning? Uh, it depends. Uh, sometimes it's having a talk like this that is fantastic. Some others is because I'm reading a book and I don't want to stop. And I, 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 the last thing that I do when I was going to sleep is reading. And sometimes I wake and say, oh my God, I'm interested about the end of this. Or uh, to have a meeting in my office or uh, to have a good meal. Uh, well, I, when I wrote one of the, my books, that is the, the name of the book is Hours, Hours, the hours of, of, of day or the hours of life. And I, I wrote about how it was to have the first baby because it was uh, dramatic, dramatic, of course. Um, it's not easy. And uh, the, the labor uh, of having the, the babies is very strong. But I, I wrote some things and I say, well, I'm sometimes happy to have a good flavor of ice cream. I love vanilla ice creams, for example. No? Then I feel, okay, I'm exactly today. I will have probably, uh, and it doesn't matter if I am 16, three years old that I'm now, uh, but I feel excited about everything. I have a small garden. I discovered during this pandemic situation that I, I have to be isolated, that I love gardening. Then I discover a lot of pleasure in a small, very small garden that I have, or maybe in some plants that we, we have on, 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 some, on some places. Uh, well, I, I love that, that situation. Then uh, it's not easy for me to maintain myself very sad the complete day. Well, I can cry. I cry a lot. I'm a crying person sometimes because I can read a book and I cry and I, or I, I watch a movie and I cry or I cry because of strong situations in life or in my family. Uh, but uh, finally I said, okay, let's go again. Let's do things. Let's uh, maintain our, our, our brain busy uh, and, and, and wanting to do things. Uh, imagine this year I, I go back to university again because I, I lead a school for leaders, for young leaders between 18 to 35. And we had to do it online now. And I don't know how to teach online. Then I go to university to learn how to teach online. Then I finalize uh, with my team. And we were like 20 persons. We went to, this, to the university again. And it was fantastic and a different experience. You said before that you have seven grandchildren. Yes, I have seven from 10 to three. Uh, it is uh, also fantastic experience. Four of, the, of them are here. The other three are in New Zealand because the father is from New Zealand, um, married with my, my daughter that is a diplomatic uh, diplomat. And well, I have seven, sometimes seven here or only four, but I'm permanent in contact with them and I love them. They say that sometimes children can ask the most insightful questions, either triggering something or um, embarrassing, you know, someone who is an adult. Yeah, it is true it's because I get divorced after 23 years of marriage. And for these small kids that they are looking the pictures and say, why granddad and you are not living together? That's an embarrassing uh, question. <laughs> And say, okay, how I can explain that? And say, well, we have a good friendship. We are friends. Sometimes he comes and have uh, dinner or lunch here, and I go there, and we are together. But we didn't want to live together. That's it. And maybe that's the, the answer. <laughs> that's the answer. But uh, sometimes it's an embarrassing question, or they ask some things. One of them, especially, is very curious about them. Um, uh, things and asking everything, every detail. What do you put there, here? That. What are you going out? What are you going? Why? Uh, and uh, yeah, they have the the time of why and why and why and why. Sometimes it says stop, no more questions. Now I'm going to make the questions to you. And they, I, I try to do in a contrary sense, and it's it's nice. But I, I love a lot, and I enjoy life with them. <laughs>